So this picture here is a junction at Fifth Avenue, East 23rd Street, and Broadway on New York, okay? Um, taken um, in 1905, okay? And if you look at the picture, you'll see horses, horse-drawn carriages, uh, and lots of people walking around. And this picture is the same picture 20 years later. And what you notice is there is not a single horse in that picture. The pace of change when there is a technology disruption, whether that's moving from horses to motor vehicles, or whether it's moving from desktop computers and server computers into the cloud, can happen within a matter of a few years. And we're in the middle of that revolution right now to cloud computing. And for research, cloud computing really does unlock a lot of potential for what you can do. And it's unlocking a massive amount of potential for any person who has an idea who wants to scale that very quickly and go global. For instance, if you were a startup. And if you think of researchers essentially as startups, the cloud gives you unprecedented capability for you to execute at speed. And when we think about that in terms of how we look at research today, this picture shows how research within the UK and also globally is stratified by the types of computing that people have access to. If you're lucky enough to be able to access something like Archer, the UK national machine, or you're part of Prace, and you can access some of the big exascale type petascale machines like LRZ in Munich, then that's fantastic and you can do heroic research. The next level down is around regional HPC. So in the UK, EPSRC just launched six uh, new fantastic compute centers at what we call tier two. So based at Oxford Jade, the big GPU cluster there at Edinburgh, Bristol with their um, very novel new ARM-based computer there. And then if you're lucky enough to be at a university that's investing in its own high performance computing, then you will have access to that. But actually, the majority, by far the majority of the researchers are here. We, these are the tiers. We call it tier four, which is a researcher who's at their desk with a laptop. And for them, actually, cloud computing is potentially revolutionary because what it does is it gives them access to the same scale of compute as anyone else. But it's not just access to compute, it's the ability to access data, it's the ability to do reproducible research, which is critical as we think about open science and open research in the future. And the cloud hooks into these things. It, it can replace some of these other systems, but it doesn't have to. It can help join up researchers across that, those many, many tiers. And what we've been doing at Microsoft Research is working with researchers around the world to see how cloud computing can help. And I um, am a researcher, was a researcher at University of Southampton for 20 years in aerospace engineering, doing a lot of computational simulation and processing experimental data, for instance, from wind tunnels and large microphone arrays, uh, X-rays, CT scan machines, large amounts of data. And some of the things that I found, and I think resonates a lot with researchers uh, in the UK and around the world, are these problems, having access to whatever compute I need, whether that's compute or data. A real problem is if I have access, but I have to queue for it because I'm fighting with lots of other us users on that particular resource. And then the other thing is not being able to actually install the software and tools that I need. Okay. Often there's a managed system which has pre-installed software. And if you've got a particular package you want installed, it's not like just installing it on your laptop. And so it can take time. It takes other people's time. Um, and it's, it can be a bit of a problem. So when we talk to researchers, we say, well, actually, do you just want a time machine? So when you've got a paper deadline in a couple of weeks, uh, when you've got a project deadline, OK? Or when your sponsor is saying, OK, let's have a meeting and see where you are. And you sort of panic and think, oh, I've got to access this resource. Oh, I've got to get into a queue. And I haven't got, oh, I can't install the software. OK, so all of those pain points that we see often come to a head when we've got some sort of deadline looming. And this is where the cloud can really help you because it gives you pretty much instant access to large amounts of compute and data. Um, when you need it and you have admin access and you can install what you want. So it actually can be really nice 
um, to use as your primary platform or to complement the other systems that you have access to. And when we think about research in the cloud and we think about cloud computing, <coughs> we often think about just these machines that are sat in a massive data center somewhere uh, and we have to move all of our data up to there. Um, but our approach uh, at Microsoft is we think about this as an intelligent cloud, so it's a cloud optimized for things like machine learning and AI. But we also think about what we call the edge. So the edge could be your smartphone, it could be an Arduino device or a Raspberry Pi, or the edge could be a server within your own university that talks seamlessly to the cloud. So when we think about the cloud, we think about the edge and how we can move data backwards and forwards and do the processing and data processing at the most appropriate point, whether that is at the edge, if you're disconnected and you're on a survey ship, for instance, or you're out in the field, and you might not have network connectivity, but at some point you can push that up to the cloud. So we think about this in a very flexible way, and it's not in the cloud or on a device. It's essentially the same system, and how we tie that together in a really, really easy way uh, is what we're trying to, trying to do. And when we think about the cloud, we all, people often worry about, oh gosh, oh, I'm gonna move on about that. Um, so they talk about the trust in the cloud. We think about, can we put our stuff in the cloud? Can we trust a large company to host our data? At Microsoft, we really run on trust. So the data is your data, it's your algorithms, it's your software, it happens to be running in our cloud. Our cloud is very, very <coughs> secure. So one example is the Metropolitan Police, the Metropolitan Police, have deployed tens of thousands of body cameras, and all of that video footage is pushed up into the Microsoft Azure cloud. It's made available um, securely through a platform called evidence.com, and that can be pushed down into the judicial system as well and used in court. And it's been used, for instance, at the Greenfell uh, um, Tower investigation, where we had 340 police officers with those body cams going through, and all of that data could be collected in Azure, so it was immediately available for the investigation. So that's where we think about an edge device like a body camera, and then pushing it up into the cloud with very, very sensitive data, all handled very securely. Another example is NHS Blood and Transplant, which uses the Azure cloud with patient data to help with transplant matching and things like that. So you can use the cloud for the most secure data. Um, you have to architect that. You have to make sure you have all the governance and policy in place. Um, but it's all very, very possible, and it's actually in many ways easier to do than if you do it yourself on your own machine. And when we think about this intelligent cloud, what does it actually enable? We think about infrastructure, we think about tins, servers, disks, but actually it's exposed to you as services. So this uh, is an eye chart. Um, if you've got good eyesight, you might be able to read it. Um, it's deliberately like this because it just shows the breadth and depth of everything that you can do. So we've got compute services, networking, storage, web, container services, databases, analytics, AI, internet of things, security, identity, monitoring, all of these services that are available to you as an API from a command line from Python, okay, just gives you access to all of this immediately. Okay, and that's the sort of power of what you can do, do with the cloud. And one of the things that we have as well is this real passion for open source. And so at Microsoft, we're now one of the leading open source companies in the world. Um, part of the Linux Foundation, Apache Foundation, uh, we are doing more and more work out in the open with a number one contributor on GitHub for open source projects as an organization, for instance. So everything I talk about is predicated on huge support for all sorts of open source uh, tools and technologies. And we've been working at Microsoft Research with lots and lots of researchers around the world to experiment with how they can use cloud computing. And we kind of have come to the conclusion there are five kind of workloads, uh, buckets, uh, where we can think about how we can use the cloud. And I want to talk through these um, today, really. Um, so the first one is kind of beyond the desktop. I've got a laptop. I'm trying to run some analysis. My laptop's not big enough. I just need a bigger machine. Okay. And we've got some really nice examples where that's a really quick win for a researcher. So they can get something done really, really quickly uh, they couldn't do before. <coughs> High performance computing in that supercomputer context. High throughput computing, where I just have lots and lots of, say, single processes jobs that I need to do in a hurry. Data science, big data machine learning, huge topic area there. Uh, and I'll talk about um, some of the concepts that we use there. The Internet of Things has some peculiarities about how you handle devices in a secure way. Um, so I'll talk about that. And then also how we handle research data, 
but increasingly how we do reproducible research and we can share our methods and algorithms with other researchers around the world. So this example is from um, uh, the University of Nottingham and University of Stirling, Sandy Brownlee at Stirling, where they were looking at <coughs> airport congestion. So when you are sat on an airplane and you're waiting to take off, the air traffic controllers have to tell you when to move the aircraft off the gate in order to make your takeoff slot, okay, which could be in, say, 15 minutes' time. So they have to figure out if you've got a takeoff slot, when to release you from the gate. It's called pushback. Now, it's actually quite a complex problem if you're at somewhere like Heathrow Airport because there's lots of congestion actually just navigating around the airport. So they've been using lots of data science techniques to do that. And what they did was they, they was taking them months to do this on their just machines under their desks. So they literally just fired up a couple of big virtual machines in Azure, and they could literally do that in a few days. And they were aggregating data, scraping it from different websites, and then running their analysis tools. And it was, again, very simple. All it was was spinning up a VM that was a lot bigger than what they had on their desk. But it meant they could do work that would take months in a few days. Really good example. And these are the types of capabilities that are available. We have several different types of these virtual machines. Some of them are general purpose for things like web serving. Some of them have huge amounts and hundreds of hundreds of gigabytes of RAM. Some of them are highly tuned for high performance computing and AI with GPUs. Some of them are tuned for very fast storage I.O. So you can choose from lots and lots of essentially different bits of hardware but they're just a mouse click away or a command line away. Um, rather than having to, for instance, go to your university and say, I need a machine with 500 gigabytes of RAM. And they say, well, you're going to have to give us you know, 15 grand for that machine, rather than going, oh, actually, I'm just going to pay $4 an hour, and I only need it for a couple of days anyway. So it gives you that flexibility of a huge kind of menu of machines to choose from, instant access to those machines and getting them at a really low cost, particularly when you only need them for a fixed amount of time. And with the actual machines, we have these pre-packaged machine images. And one of the ones that's really, really popular is something we call the data science virtual machine. So this is a, a machine that's pre-installed with a huge number of standard packages that we know data scientists love. So things like Python, things like R server, things like Julia, um, things like you know, different databases, things like Weka. Um, all of those things pre-installed. So when you fire up this machine, all of this stuff is installed for you. You can just get going. Okay, so this is really powerful. Um, we even have a deep learning virtual machine that hooks into GPUs. It's got things like TensorFlow, CNTK, Cafe2 pre-installed. So you don't have to go through all of those installs, check if the drivers are working, etc. So it saves a huge amount of time just being able to use these pre-packaged. Uh, pre and you'll be able to play with this uh, later on today. So we have those sort of virtual machines, and then when we want to string those together to get some really high performance, and I'm a high-performance high HPC person kind of by my background, uh, I get excited about things like this. I used to do work with all of the Formula One teams, and this is a, a simulation that a typical Formula One team might have been doing five years ago, 140 million cells. That's quite a big calculation. Um, and what you can see on the x-axis here is the number of compute cores that this scales to. And what you show here is basically we can scale this to 1,000 cores to do this simulation using this InfiniBand high performance networking technology. So it's one of the fast networks that you get for any sort of HPC cluster. Very low latency. Whenever somebody tells you that they're doing HPC in the cloud, but they're talking about latencies in milliseconds, OK, that's not HPC. That's high throughput computing. You need to be in the microsecond range for the latency to really get this type of scaling. Um, a more extreme example here is something called NAMD. So this is doing molecular dynamic simulation. And this is just showing us scaling right up to 4,000 cores. This is the sort of thing that happens if you're running on a cloud which doesn't have the InfiniBand performance. It's what we expect. It tails off after a couple of hundred cores, maybe. So, so you can do this real kind of high performance computing in the cloud if you've got the right hardware. And when you can do that, it can really shorten the time it takes you to do your research. And I used to be at the University of Southampton, and we actually have worked with Southampton on a project where they have been using uh, the Azure HPC to really accelerate some of their data science work. And so here's um, a little video of them telling you about that. Poverty is absolutely gendered. We know that women are more likely to be poor, women are more susceptible to falling into poverty, in addition to the fact that 
pulling women out of poverty has multiple ripple effects within a community that have benefits not only for the woman herself as far as her health and her education and her opportunities are concerned but also for her children. There's about two billion people in the world today who are so poor that what they earn every day is less than the price of a cappuccino. And those people aren't there by accident. Those people are poor because they live in a poor country, because they live in a poor part of a poor country. And many of them are poor because they're women, because in almost all countries of the world, women earn less than men. Being able to eradicate poverty, we need to know where poor people live. To utilize big data sources from satellites and open source GIS and mobile phones, we can really get a high resolution picture of poverty on the ground. WorldPop's mission is to count every person on Earth. We map not just numbers of people, but their age structures, their characteristics in terms of uh, poverty, in terms of disease rates. For the kind of work that we do, we need the high performance computing. We're using huge data sets. Azure was the only cloud that gave us true supercomputing performance. We have the computing technology, we have the data sources to sort of put this all together to understand the information that we have and really reach out to the people in need and make a difference. We are focused on empowering governments, agencies to, to continue to monitor, to continue to measure. Considering poverty and eradicating poverty, it is achievable. They're using the Southampton High Performance Computing Cluster, um, but they're also using Azure alongside that. And it's particularly useful when they need to turn around results very, very quickly. So they were helping the United Nations in the uh, relief operations for Hurricane Irma, for instance, to show where all the people were and where they were moving around in the disaster area. And they needed to turn that around really quickly so they couldn't sit in the queue of the university high performance computing system. They could just fire this up on Azure and just turn it around and send it over to the UN. So it really shows how you can use whichever system is most appropriate depending on, on your situation. So I guess a lot of you are interested in AI and machine learning. And we know that um, to do a lot of that uh, work, particularly around deep learning, GPUs are really, really important. So we have a very strategic partnership with um, NVIDIA. And uh, we deploy GPUs on Azure. Actually, here, Ken Heafield's been running on thousands of GPUs for some of his machine translation work that he wouldn't have access to otherwise. And so um, we have access to K80s, we have P40s and P100s coming on stream next week. Um, and then very exciting, just last week at Supercomputing, we announced that we're also deploying V100s on Azure um, with NVIDIA. So we actually co-designed what we call the HGX1. Some of you might have heard of the DGX1 server. So HGX1 is our equivalent that we've co-designed with NVIDIA um, that we're putting in our data centers to deploy the, the V100s. So, I'm very excited that we have such a strategic partnership with NVIDIA so we can bring the very latest GPU hardware and make that really, really easily available through Azure. But when you want to do this, and the whole kind of end-to-end -end, uh, machine learning experience, there are lots of different parts in the pipeline. Uh, one of the things we've done, and we just released this a few weeks ago, is something we call the Azure Machine Learning Workbench. So this is actually a desktop tool. Um, which allows you to create your machine learning models, test them, score them, um, and it even does um, a cleanup. So this is really interesting. This is something um, that actually originally shipped in Excel. It's something called Flash Fill in Excel. So this uses program synthesis. So what you do is you basically, you have some data, you give it some examples. So it says, I've got the data. I want to create these windows, and uh, time windows. So it says 5 to 5.30. And what it does is it looks at what you're doing and says, oh, I think I know what you're doing. I'm going to write a computer program to do that. And that's called program synthesis. Uh, and, and we've embedded that in Excel. It's called Flash Fill. And here it's in Azure Machine Learning Workbench. So it can help automate some of the data description and data cleaning process for you by writing programs based on you giving it examples. So it's really, really powerful, interesting use of machine learning for machine learning. Um, uh, and this tool allows you to run things in the cloud, scale out GPU clusters. It does versioning of your machine learning models as you're developing different models. So it's a really, really powerful um, tool, something you can play with. It's free. Uh, it runs on a Mac. We've also made it run on Windows as well. So um, 
This is something you will be playing with today. It's called Azure Machine Learning Studio. This has been around for a bit longer. Um, and this um, allows you in the cloud to create a machine learning model where you basically can feed it data at the top here, and it's a nice graphical uh, interface. <laughs> and then you can clean up data, and then you can um, essentially execute machine learning models, and then you can score them and check them. You can compare different models side by side, looking at the ROC, AUC. Uh, and then once you're really happy with that, you can then turn that into a REST API. And then you can call that from your own programs, uh, your own web services as well. And you know, one of the challenges with machine learning is you can develop things on your laptop in R or Python or whatever your favorite framework is. But how you take that and deploy that for a real world application or at scale is really, really hard. If you think about how do I make that available on the web, I have to create a web application, I have to make an API, I have to secure it. I have to make sure it scales if it get hit, gets hit by lots of users at one time. With this, you click a button and it does all of that for you and it puts out an API, even does the documentation for you on how to call the API automatically. So again, it's really, really interesting to simplify the machine learning process. So it's not just about developing and running the algorithms, but how can we develop tools to make it easier for you to do that end-to-end, -end, including the deployment. Researchers often don't think about how they deploy it at the end for the application. And some of these tools just help you do that, developing the models, but also um, deploying the models. Um, and we've been working with our friends just over the road in UCL, um, where they've been doing some really interesting text mining work um, and using um, Azure Machine Learning Studio um, to be able to deploy that for the NHS. <coughs> So what systematic reviews allow us to do is to bring together a large body of knowledge into a fairly short, manageable uh, piece of work that gives us the best possible guidance on the effects of healthcare interventions. Research had been done that looked at whether steroids were helpful in improving the maturation of premature babies' lungs shortly after they were born. The systematic review showed conclusively that steroids would save lives in premature babies. This has saved tens or hundreds of thousands of babies' lives. At the moment, it can take two, three years to complete a systematic review. So it, it sounds quite labour intensive, and it is. I was introduced to text mining in about 2006, 7 and the promise of text mining was it would solve a lot of these problems for us. And we're starting to see some of the fruits of that labour now in using machine learning to make the systematic review process more efficient. Project Transform is an artificial intelligence project that brings together the technology that's able to manipulate and analyse data very efficiently and therefore allow the researchers to do what they do best, which is to understand the data and interpret the findings. What I love about all of this is that it's all about that partnership between the human and the machine so that we can then better direct human effort where it's most needed. So what we're doing now in development with Cochrane and the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence is building surveillance systems which identify research upstream as it's published. We're using the Cortana intelligence suite to enable us to develop and deploy these machine learning applications in the cloud. We've covered areas such as paediatric medication error, um, hepatitis C, lots and lots of work on healthy eating, obesity, physical activity. All of the hot topics of the day is what we get to work on. If systematic reviews can be conducted more quickly, that means that decision makers can be informed in a timely way, improving guidelines, improving decision making, therefore helping patient health. So there, they'd been developing these algorithms for many, many years, but when it came to actually deploying them at scale, that's where the cloud came in. They could take the, their R routine. In fact, they'd done it in R, and they could take the R routines, and there's a, a module called execute R script. They put it in the cloud, and then actually they rewrote those in Python because it was more efficient, and they could swap out the R module, dump in the Python module, uh, and then just redeploy the web service. So it kind of gave them a lot of flexibility uh, to do that. And then when we think about those... Um, Actual machine learning algorithms, there are lots of, lots of different frameworks out there, things like TensorFlow, Cafe Tiziano. Um, the one that we use at Microsoft for about 80% of the, the sort of machine learning AI workloads, so things like our Bing image search engine, um, things like our, our Microsoft Translator, Skype Translator, is something we call um, CNTK, or the Cognitive Toolkit. 
Uh, for those of you who do deep learning, this might make sense. Um, so <laughs> it's a kind of higher level abstraction um, of how we do uh, networks. And we, you know, we're building higher and higher levels of abstraction. So it's something to have a look at. It's a fully open source project. Uh, it scales very, very nicely on multiple machines and multiple GPUs. It's something that's very challenging if you're doing uh, deep, deep learning, is how do you actually scale across machines rather than just on a single machine? And it's something that Cognitive Toolkit is very, very heavily tuned for, which is why um, it works for things like ImageNet um, and things like the switchboard test for speech recognition, and it sort of gives us a, an advantage um, for those things, but also we take that advantage and we give it over to the community as an open source um, project there. And so um, an interesting example is um, this project we've done with the Snow Leopard Trust um, for these cute little things, Snow Leopards, they're actually very, very rare. Um, and tracking them is really hard. They're normally tracked with uh, camera traps. So you take a camera, you stick it out in their habitat, and whenever anything walks past it, it snaps a picture. And then somebody, a person, has to go through each one of those images and find the ones that have got snow leopards. Okay, and it takes something that really constrains what the Snow Leopard Trust can do. So what we did is we built um, a uh, deep neural network for them. Uh, and you can see a picture of it here. Um, and we actually um, were able to train it. Um, I think it was uh, with ResNet. Um, it's the ResNet 50. And then we could train it on the snow leopards. But what we could do is deploy the cognitive toolkit to do the image recognition. We have something called Microsoft Machine Learning Spark, which is, a, again, a, a piece of Microsoft technology that allows you to deploy over a Spark cluster deploy the Spark cluster in order to do this. So there's a little um, URL there, aka.ms slash snow leopard, that goes into a bit more detail around how this was built. So sometimes you need to just build that pipeline, build your classifier, but then it allows you to then scale this onto something like a Spark cluster. And we want to make it easier and easier for you to do this type of work. And we just launched something we call Azure Batch AI. So this allows you to take any tool that you have um, and then run it on a GPU cluster. And it will spin up the GPU cluster really easily and run all that training for you. So Batch AI is trying to make that easier. And that's kind of one of the things we try and do is we're trying to make all of this technology easier and easier for you to use. Okay? You're still in control. You're still writing all the code. But a lot of that plumbing you know, is a real pain, basically. And, and so we try and do some of that heavy lifting for you. Again, very much based on open source technology. But we can make it even easier. And so we built something called the custom vision service. OK, so what you do is if you need to, for instance, uh, and the, you know, you need to build a cat recognition engine, right, which is very important. You can basically upload a bunch of pictures that are tagged, click a button that says train, and we'll train a deep neural network on the back end and return that to you in a few minutes. OK, so this is something you can try out this afternoon. Um, again, it's state of the art. It's using CNTK. It's using one of the best deep neural networks in the world, built on you know all the Azure GPUs. Gives you all of that horsepower, but just behind uh, like a web page or an, an API and a command line tool. So, so if you want to do anything, so this could be tagging images, um, you know, for medical application or some you know social science application. Um, you know, you, you can see the tags in here, and you can train it, and then you can. Uh, you can um, also retrain it on the fly as well. So if you get it wrong, you can say, no, actually, it was wrong, and it will retrain the neural network. So it's really, really easy. This is sort of spectacular in terms of ease of use for a deep neural network. And then we have a bunch of APIs. We call them the Cognitive Service APIs, which are just REST APIs, things like the Vision Service. Um, obviously, you've got our Web, AP, web Search API as well. We've got something called the um, Knowledge Service. Uh, where is it? Do, 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 do. The academic knowledge service. So we have something called the um, the Microsoft Academic Graph. So we have a graph of all academic publications, all researchers, all conferences and workshops, as a graph, and you can query that with an API. Okay. So very interesting when you're looking at things like scientific communication, how researchers work together, those types of things. So a very broad selection of just APIs. Again, those are things that you can play with today. The big data word phrase comes up a lot. Big data is important. Small data can sometimes be even more important. Um, but data generally is, is something that uh, we struggle to deal with increasingly, uh, and we need tools to do that. So at the Cornell uh, lab, they've built a, an application called eBird. So if you are a birder and like to go bird watching, you can download this app. 
And you can basically tell the app that you've spotted a bird of a particular species, it's geotag, it's time tag. So that then gets sent up to the eBird system, and then they can use that to basically do their research and see what's, uh, what's happening uh, around the world and aggregate that. And they had a real problem because the, the data rate was growing so much, they had to do batch processing on this, which meant it would take, take sort of days and days and days to process it. So what they did was they spun up a Hadoop cluster on Azure, so it all gets put into a Hadoop cluster, and they can just crank through that processing really, really quickly in a matter of hours rather than waiting days and weeks for it. So it's, it's really interesting. And one of the things we have um, in Azure is this ability to spin up clusters um, very quickly. I'll just skip the video. Um, so we have a service called HD Insight, which is our sort of big data clusters as a service. Um, and you can spin up things like Hadoop, Apache Storm, Apache Spark clusters very, very easily. And within sort of 10 or 15 minutes, you can spin up a big cluster. We also have just released our um, Spark on containers. So you can do the same thing and spin up a Spark cluster on containers if you want to do it that way. And it's an interesting example where at a lot of universities, we know the universities are building these fantastic Hadoop clusters. Um, so one example is the University of Cambridge, um, where they've got a really nice, fantastic HPC system and also a very nice Hadoop system there. And so they developed this application where they're trying to model agents around London. So this is over a million agents uh, interacting uh, across London. And so they were doing that on the Cambridge machine. Um, but then they needed to front end it with a website, and they need to make this interactive which is not practical with the way their system is set up. So what they did was they took the system they built on premise in their machine, and they lifted and shifted and put that into Azure on a Hadoop cluster. So they could create the same thing. They did all the development on the university machine, but when they wanted to publish, publish that as an interactive web system, they could do that and use Azure. So again, using the best tool for the job and what you have available allows you to have that massive amount of flexibility um, with what you're doing. And when we think about large amounts of data. Um, you often hear this phrase around data lakes. So data lake is where you can basically throw your structured and unstructured data and have some sort of uniform access pattern for that. So our data lake, um, you have an HDFS layer over the top of it, so you can access it in a very systematic way. This was actually a kind of refactoring of our own search engine backend. So it gives you a sense of scale. So this is built for exabyte scale data. Okay, the file size limit for a single file is a petabyte. Okay, so it's that scale. When we talk about big data, we really mean big data. Um, but we make that, again, really, really easy to deploy. And then you can put your clusters on top, so your Spark clusters, your Hadoop clusters, like we saw with the Cambridge folks, and then build other kind of query services on top. So it gives you this very scalable kind of structured, unstructured uh, data lake um, sort of model. And there's other ways you can manage data in the cloud. Um, we launched something called the Cosmos DB. This is the world's first planet scale database. Okay? It's designed to scale across data centers in different continents. Okay? Azure's got data centers all around the world. It's got more regions than any other cloud provider. We're the first cloud provider to deploy, um, going to be deploying in South Africa, for instance. We've got data centers in the UK, which is very important if you're dealing, for instance, with UK health data or security data. So this allows you to scale a database across data centers in different continents, which is really, really hard. If any of you look at database consistency models, okay, there's generally two. And so doing this is very, very hard to do. So what we've done is we've built this layer at the bottom, for instance, with extra consistency levels. Okay, so we've got three intermediate consistency levels that allow us to then scale. And Leslie Lamport, who's one of the people who's kind of written the textbook on distributed computing, uh, designed this. He's one of our researchers at Microsoft. He's more famous for writing the guide to LaTeX, potentially. <laughs> so if you've got the little blue book for LaTeX, that's Leslie. But he's actually designed these consistency models in, in Cosmos DB. So you have this planet scale infrastructure, okay, that you don't have to worry about. We worry about that. And then what we do is we layer different data models on top of it. So the same system has a graph model, a document model, a tabular model a key value store model. And then what we do is we put access layers on top, including different open source ones. So you have different ways of accessing this huge substrate of data. Okay, and that depends whether you've got an operational workload or an analytic workload. So you can tailor this to what you want with a single data kind of storage platform underneath, planet scale. If you're used to working with something that's a bit more of a standard relational database, we have something called our relational database platform. If you think about relational databases, they all kind of do the same thing. 
<coughs> so what we've done is we've built a core platform that spreads across our Azure data infrastructure. And then we put different front ends onto it. So we have a MySQL front end or a Postgres front end. But you get the advantage of all of this service platform on-demand scaling, disaster recovery, tuning, and monitoring, whether you're running SQL Server, whether you're running MySQL or Postgres. Okay, so again, very much there's an open source route to this, but we handle a lot of the hard work underneath to make sure that behaves well. So the cloud is really, really interesting in terms of being able to handle data in lots of different ways depending on what you prefer, or sometimes it's worth looking at what you're trying to do and seeing if there's something here that will do it better. Okay, and gives you a better trajectory going forwards with your research. As I mentioned, IoT has its own little unique problems um, around handling devices. Uh, we did a project with the UK Met Office. Uh, they've got this uh, weather observations website, the WOW service. Uh, and they basically, you can register your weather station with the Met Office. Okay, and you can feed data into the Met Office to help them with their science and their forecasts. Um, and they need this to really scale, so they've, they've built this onto the Azure platform, IoT platform, and so it can feed in data from all over the place. Same platform, we worked with Rolls-Royce aircraft engines, where they're using the same Azure IoT platform for telemetry from their aircraft engines. Okay, so that essentially they can collect data from the engines, do things like predictive maintenance to see whether bits of an engine might need replacing. Um, and be able to do much, much more efficient uh, um, analysis on that. And it's all built on this same platform. This We call it the Azure IoT platform. And it handles all these different parts, the devices, the gateways for gathering data, the insights, the action, the security. Okay, the ability to spin up an Azure uh, IoT platform in 10 minutes, okay, rather than spending three years of a PhD trying to build this pipeline. Right. Um, you know, we've spent a lot of time, we've got a dedicated team to build this out, and it's the same thing that Rolls-Royce is using, it's the same thing that Met Office is using, the same thing that you can use for your research. For instance, if you're doing air pollution monitoring, I know there are some people doing that, um, you know, even like with traffic cameras um, and things like that. So really taking advantage of the things that are built as infrastructure and platforms so that you can concentrate on your research. And we're working with Petras, which is a big UK IoT project, and they're building what they call the IoT Observatory um, on this Azure IoT platform uh, as we speak. And the, the last area I want to talk about is something I'm quite passionate about, which is open science and reproducible research. We know it's hard to share data. It's even harder to share the methods that we do around the data to have reproducible research. <coughs> and we're big fans of something called Jupyter Notebooks. How many of you use Jupyter no Notebooks or heard of Jupyter Notebooks? Okay. So we have something called the Azure Notebook Service. Um, so this is a free service, and you can host these uh, on the cloud, but they're executable notebooks. So it's not just NB Viewer, but this is a notebook with a link. You share the link with somebody else, and they click Run, and it fires up a container with the notebook running in the container. So it's a really nice way of sharing your research with other people. It's a really nice way of running Jupyter Notebooks at scale. So at Cambridge University, they're using this for their first year undergraduate Python course. At Berkeley, they're using Jupyter Notebooks with their own Jupyter Hub infrastructure for their data science uh, course, which has got 1,300 students. Okay, and that's with Fernando Perez, who's the person who created Jupyter. Um, so it's really nice in order to just give you a really simple infrastructure for deploying that. We've actually got the Turing Python course up on Azure Notebooks as well um, for people learning Python. And for science, you can use it to share your results and share your methods. So the LIGO consortium have their Open Science Center. And if you go to the LIGO Open Science Center and you go to their tutorials page here, there's an Azure button. And you click the Azure button and it spins up a Jupyter notebook. You can pull the data down for the gravitational waves discovery and you can rerun some of their analysis and learn their analysis tools. Really, really nice way of sharing your methods using Jupyter notebooks. So you package up the data, the methods, um, really, really fantastic. So again, something um, that you can play with later on today, and it's free. Um, uh, and so it's, yeah, we really love that one. And one of the things here is when we're trying to do reproducible research, when we're trying to replicate research, there are differences between replication and reproducibility, and we can talk about that, um, talk about that later. Um, but uh, we know that containers and things like Docker are really, really interesting in terms of how do I package an application. Rather than a virtual machine where I package from the operating system up, 
containers allow me to just package the application potentially with some data and share that. Um, but even spinning up containers, you need to have some infrastructure. So we've created something called Azure Container Instances. So this is a fully managed set of containers. You just do AZ Container Create, and it creates a container. Okay, just in a, in a couple of seconds. So this little demo shows us just typing in a single command line, and I spin up a container. Okay, it's saying container show here, and it will show us that that container has now spun up. Um, and then actually, it's a it's a little web page, um, so it will show you then, hopefully, yeah, it'll go to that web page. Okay, so this is the container that's just spun up. Okay, and then I think we're going to just go in. Uh, look at it, so we want to check that that really is the container, and I'm not cheating, that that was uh, something I built earlier, and then I can go in and do container delete. Okay, so it's that quick to spin up a container, have a look at it, look at the list of containers, and then delete it. So it just shows you how flexible the cloud is in terms of just when we think about it in this context of containers rather than virtual machines. And it's kind of, we talk about this sort of cloud first thinking. So rather than thinking about machines and hardwares and networking, if we think about containers, we think about something called Azure Functions Serverless Computer. It gives us a lot of um, interesting thoughts about what we can do. Um, we've also got something called um, the Azure Container Service, which supports Kubernetes. So if you're doing Kubernetes deployment as well. So again, containers is something that we really, really like. Um, this is the Kubernetes service. Um, so again, this is just uh, AKS Create, and this will just create um, a Kubernetes cluster, um, just at command line. So it shows you kind of um, what you can do. We've got something called Azure Service Fabric <coughs> that sits underneath, and there's a really cool demo that Mark Rasinovich did. He was here a few, a few weeks ago, um, and he spun up a million containers uh, in about a min minute and a half, I think. So, <laughs> so it shows you just that scale of what you can do with, with containers. It's really, um, you know, really, really exciting. So I've kind of gone through and showed you quite a lot of different aspects of what you can do with the cloud. Um, again, just trying to do a whistle-stop tour to give you a flavor. Okay, There's a lot there. Um, but you really just need to play around with it. Uh, you know, I'm here, the team are here um, to help kind of work with you on that. And one of the things we've got at the Alan Turing Institute is this fantastic partnership around cloud computing. Uh, this is Andrew Blake. We launched it uh, last year when Satya Nadella, our CEO, was visiting London. Um, and we've uh, been working with the RSC team like Martin and Marve and other people here at the Turing um, and with people at different universities to see what people can do. And so we're really at our stage now where we, we've got a pretty good handle on what you can do. Uh, and we want to help, help all of you make the best use of the cloud, whether you're here at the Turing or other um, research institutes. And so we've done a, a couple of little case studies here at the Turing. Uh, and one is with Chinooki here, who's doing some uh, computational social science, science work. So I just want to finish off with this nice little um, snippet of what she's been doing. You can imagine, when we want to boost our well-being, we often seek out these really beautiful places. But the problem is, how do you measure these beautiful places? And that's not been an easy thing to do. Um, so luckily, I came across this website and it's this online game people play, and it's really simple. You just rate these images between 1 and 10. What's happening in the background is that each image represents a square kilometer of the United Kingdom. So I've got like over 200,000 images have been rated about 1.5 million times. So I'm using Azure to train my deep learning models because I really need GPU access. What's really great about using Azure is that I can train models in a matter of days, which normally would take months on my desktop. So our research also seeks to measure aspects of the world that we as humans have always been hugely aware of, but that traditionally we've had near to no numbers on. I think an excellent example of this is the beauty of environments that we spend our time in. So I think many of us have this impression that that's something which can have a real impact on our day-to-day -day well-being. So we do find that people are happier in these more beautiful environments and they, they can be these beautiful natural scenes, but I was really surprised to find that people are also happier in more beautiful city environments and people actually do find buildings as being beautiful as well. So I'm really excited about the possibilities of data science because I strongly believe that data science will change the world for the better. So 
there's a lot out there in terms of what we can do with Azure, and there's a couple of um, initiatives we've got. One of them literally just launched a few days ago, something we call AI School. Um, so if you, if you go to AI School Online, there are these courses that just run you through pretty quickly in an hour or two um, some of the different tools and techniques that you can use in order to do AI in the cloud. And then we've also got another website which is slightly broader around data science. It's called Learn Analytics at Microsoft. Again, lots and lots of online material there. It also has a list of different certifications you can do for data science. It also has a course catalog of in-person training events around the world um, that we run with our partners around data science as well. So we're very much around promoting how people can make best use of the cloud for AI um, and data science. So I really have a call to action for you all, which is to work with us to do absolutely epic research, whichever university you're at or here at the Alan Turing Institute. So thank you.